so good to see you. So nice to see you too. Man, it's been ages. It's been a couple of years. Oh, fucking. But you look the same. Except for the hair, likewise. Yeah, except for, for slightly longer hair. Yeah. So, yeah, well, geez, I would have been really short hair back then. I think I was my, playing... ha- my hair was about this short Dude, when we were super, filming. Super short. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. How are you? You good? Yeah, really well. Thanks if, for having me. Well, thanks for coming down. Thanks for reaching out. I have to say, and I did say this before, but I think it's important to go back over. I wasn't sure if I was ever going to hear from you again. <laughs> <laughs> And so I was really surprised. But but interestingly enough, I was like, oh, great, Dina. And then I was thinking as I was like, I kind of saw it pop up as I was driving and I caught some of the first lines and I was like, geez, I hope she's turning this into a feature and she's talking to me about that. Oh, so my God. The, 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 the career aspect came in. I don't know if that short film could be a feature. It would be people already were saying the idea wasn't long enough even for a short film. So really? I think it would need a lot more in it. Although it could be the opening scene to a feature maybe in the future. Yeah, I mean the premise the um, of moi, your film, um, is a very real one. And you were ahead of the curve too on that, right? Because the Me Too thing hadn't quite kicked into gear yet. That's true actually. I think – just after we made the movie, um, Me Too started happening and it was really good timing. I guess at the time I thought there are no movies about what it feels like to be sexually harassed. There are no films about that feeling. So that's why I made it. And, it, yeah, it was, it was really good timing. I just have this terrible feeling that I have not pressed record on the video. Okay. This is one of the downfalls of doing it all on your own. <laughs> that's okay. So this will be in the video. <laughs> I did. Yay. I hate that feeling, but I'm such a scatterbrain, so I have to double check. No, it's better to check now than to get to the end and then have to redo. There's there's one podcast that I that I um, subscribe to on, on, on occasion and he has got high profile guests, but he does it all on his own. It's stressful. Oh, actually Mark Maron's is the same. Do you ever listen to What the Fuck, Mark Maron? No. Should I? Have do you watch Glow? Oh, I've actually just started watching it. Right, yeah. so he's the, the, the director. Oh, cool. Yeah, and he's got a podcast called What the Fuck and he's been doing it for years. He's had Obama on there when he, I'm pretty sure when he was a president. Wow. In his garage. Wow. And I think he's the only person to ever have Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio on a podcast. Wow. And had them together. Nice. But he had all these tech issues in the middle of... Because <laughs> he, he had to go to them and he's got his laptop and his microphones. and How come he didn't just get an assistant? I don't I'm sure people would kill to be an assistant right. on that Can podcast. Can you imagine? It's not like he can't afford it now. He's killing it. <laughs> I think it's part of his shtick to do it on his own mm. like he has always done. Um, so anyways, let's go back because I wanted to say um, – so anyways, yes, I'm, I'm pumped that you reached out and I'm pumped that Moi is now online. Me too. Yeah, that's great. I hadn't, no one except Eric has seen it too. So I've been now able to share it around to everyone can see me doing the. Doing the creepy stuff. Doing the creepy stuff. <laughs> um, but, but so let's just say, let's just spitball this for a second. Mm-hmm. If, if that were, if you were or someone was, whatever, developing that into a feature, what would be the premise of that? Yeah, you're right. You would have to do like it would because the way that I was cast in it was because of the juxtaposition to the classic stereotype of mm. who might be in that car. So mm-hmm. you had me in like dad shirts and sweaters and Yeah, which, I really didn't want um because it was based on a true story of I mean, I've been catcalled so many times, but there was this one time when I was walking home in North Melbourne and I was walking home in the dark and I heard this sound. It was this soft squelching sound and it was so unusual I was looking around I didn't know what it was and then I heard it again like this Uh. sound and I turned around and there was this man in a car and yeah he was doing it to me and I was so surprised (laughs) in the moment but also um terrified also terrified afterwards and then um then after that I was really angry but um the man who did to me, he was a tr- he was I think he was a tradie because he was in a pickup truck with like the high vis shirt. <laughs> and what it's a giveaway, a, it's dude! It's such a stereotype, and <laughs> yeah. I just I didn't want I didn't want to make this movie um, a stereotype. I wanted it to be more like because in the real world, I think women are made to feel uncomfortable by 
so many different kinds of men and a lot of the time it's just people they work with or just ordinary guys. So yeah. that's why I didn't want to make it a tradie or something that you would expect. I wanted the man who mm-hmm. you played to be um, very relatable and, you know, normal or whatever. Did that – so so before I let my brain go on another tangent, it would be interesting then if, if you saw that expanded – as to him drive off and go back to his family and mm. walk in the door with, you know, two young girls mm-hmm, or whatever mm-hmm. and, uh, and a seemingly loving wife and what have you and then her go back home and deal with the fallout mm. of that experience and then you have this kind of linear sort of storytelling of the two juxtapositions like that because that otherwise it's just, oh, yeah, he goes back to his single bed bed apartment and jerks off and yeah whatever and it's gross but the it way it is that you really interesting it, to think about it yeah. with him having a family because so many um, men who are end up being accused of sexual harassment do have families and kids and a whole um a whole life that people value you know I think that sort of boils down to this common thing where people whether they don't they they proactively don't want to or they aren't trained to putting the shoe on the other foot like if if that is the case how can you not imagine what it would feel like to know that that happened to one of your children and that what you're doing has to stop it, but it, it, it doesn't do you know what i mean like i have sort of not one arguments but i have been able to highlight points through that exercise just let's just run this scenario out for a second. Imagine if you walked in and someone did this to you, da, 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 and you, you do it in such a way that leads them to that place of, oh fuck, you know they've, they've mm. never been able to do for themselves mm-hmm. or didn't want to. It's, I mean, it's kind of fascinating. Um, what was the? Did you find through whoever you spoke to about the film afterwards and what have you that that Um, intentional character choice paid off so that when you do get that snapshot of the driver Mm -hmm. that they're like, oh, shit. I had a couple of people say that they were really glad that it was just a normal dude who did it. Right, great. Because it spoke to their own personal experience. So I'm I'm really glad I made that decision. That choice. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. It also makes it seem less about the person and more about just the the world in a way. Mm-hmm. So you can't blame it. Oh, he's just the kind of guy who would do that. To make him more universal and just kind of like an every man kind of character, it speaks more to the just the world we live in and a bit more about um yeah, the the broader problem as opposed to people just writing off that film as, oh, that was just mm-hmm. s- specific to her and him in that moment. It's Right, it I can wanted, happen to me. Yeah, I wanted the film to be more like this is um, a universal kind of story. Yeah. yeah, fuck. That's so true because that makes it real for everyone. And you played it so well. Like when we were auditioning um, for the role of the man, there were so many guys who came in and they were just so over the top oh, with right. their like, you know, when they were – all they had to do was um, pretend to be in a car and do a little kiss. <laughs> but so many guys were just acting really scary and um, oh, right. and doing really over the top kind of performances. And when you came in, it was so great because you were just your, yourself. Oh, just myself. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like, shit. It, it's exactly <laughs> what we needed. We just needed someone to be normal, like a normal right, right, guy. Right. Yeah. And to just do a kiss as if, you know, as you would to, I don't know, like a friend your, or. Your missus. Yeah, hey, exactly. Yeah. And it's that familiar kind of way to do it to a stranger. Yeah, That's what that, makes that it really makes frightening. Totally. So I'm so glad that we crossed paths. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a trip. Um, it's a funny thing because everything that you're ever taught in acting school is, you know, be big when, when big is required, but but ultimately always be natural and be real. And it mm-hmm. is the fucking hardest thing to do. For sure. Um, to not lean into whatever you think the tone is. Absolutely. You know? Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what it was. Yeah. And yeah. just you don't have to. Like, I mean, that's why I said to you, I was like, I really appreciate the kind words, but everything was set up so perfectly well so that the moment you do see me for that blink, 
the car, her feelings, the ticking, the light, the sound. It, it's already led the audience to that place. I really like that shot because um, it's it took so much planning. Do you remember how mm-hmm. you were in a car further back and there was a radio down there to time it? <laughs> yeah. and. It was so hard to get the timing right because that hill is deceivingly steep and Bethany did such a good job of riding the bike. It was a barely roadworthy bike. It was my childhood bike, (laughs) which I now in hindsight (laughs) think I should have splurged out on an actual (laughs) bike because... Here's this thing that that doesn't work anymore and there's there's only one gear, but enjoy that hill. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was really tough. So she did a really good job of riding the bike up and then, yeah, we had to get the timing of you driving your car down in the background to get up at the exact same time. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, you guys killed it. Yeah, right. Logistically different. It was it like one in the morning? Yeah, I think. Did we shoot between what midnight and four a.m.? Something like that. I yeah, feel yeah, so yeah. sorry for the neighbours on that street because we were yelling. Yeah, and it's hard. Hey, I had the same <laughs> here. We were shooting for four days straight. Every every day finished at about three thirty here yeah. for Lauren. Um, which man, I wish you did direct because it, it was a <laughs> fucking nightmare. <laughs> um. And I was like, oh, God. And they got lights on outside yeah. and, you know, action. And we're driving cars in and out. Like, yeah. Fuck. But luckily I, I know most of my neighbours. I never even told them, but they were pretty good. with. I never got any complaints, thank fuck. Yeah. But it is, it is hard to keep a crew quiet, especially when they're clutching at straws at 3 a.m. The, 3 and and especially all, when you're revving the engine as well, like on the spot. Yeah, take take <laughs> 17, okay, for yeah. it. You know. <laughs> that was uh, good though because I think I'd just come back from Germany that week and so I was on a different um, – I was really jet-lagged at the oh, time. Oh, and before so, the shooting started? Yeah, I okay. came back a few days just before we started shooting and so – Staying up all night, it was actually perfect. I, and plus the adrenaline of making a movie that will keep you wide awake as well. So, Is that your first? Film. Yeah. Uh, I made a, a couple of films when I was at film school before Which is, that. Where would you go? Uh, VCA. Right, right, right. So cool. you make a movie um, in Each. first year, second year and third year. So I'd done yeah. those and this was my first movie outside of film school. Um, it's really fascinating to see. I suppose it's not that fascinating. I, it's more encouraging to see like the progression when you act in a first year Mm. VCA film to a final. And also making them because when you make your first year VCA film, you think it's going to be so great. So great. And then when you watch it, you're like, (laughs) oh my, this is barely a movie. (laughs) (laughs) I remember my first year VCA film, I thought it was going to be like, you know, masterpiece, blah, blah. And then when I actually edited all the scenes together, it was so quick because I didn't understand about how to pace something and how to pace in between scenes. And I think it was meant to go for five minutes, but it actually went for about 45 seconds. (laughs) (laughs) You made a trailer. (laughs) And so my friend, my really great friend, Alex, um, who's an amazing filmmaker, he said, you should just open with some really long credits and just have the credits come on and then use a soundscape on black to space it out a little so i think i had one minute credits at the beginning with just music and sounds and stuff and then the actual film was about 45 seconds (laughs) it was not the best (laughs) but some really great people gave up their time to be involved and they were awesome any any kickback from your actors who were looking for footage (laughs) yeah i don't know if anyone's using that one in their show reel but they were actually really talented actors and the crew was incredible it just i was i was the worst (laughs) one there Yeah, definitely. But that's part of it, hey, fucking hell. I I recently, um, so like a couple of the first student films that I did, I mean, the first one that I ever did is absolute rubbish. And and, and from all of us, I mean, I had no acting training at that point and terrible makeup. I was supposed to be like a washed out rock and roller who had cirrhosis of the liver. Okay. So they were (laughs) trying to give me jaundice and I was like. Oh, wow. I know that you want me to look jaundiced, but 
I just look yellow at the moment. Look like fucking Homer Simpson. You know, yeah, like, jaundice and a, and a first year film project don't go together. <laughs> yeah, it's like this, you need to be really skilled at this. Yeah. And you're just painting me yellow. So this is a fail straight out of the gate. So many, this is the thing. So many first year um, projects, they're so ambitious. Mm. You know, they try and do so much. In fact, I think my first year and third year VCA projects were trying to do 20 times more than I did in this movie. The ones, right. This movie was so simple. It was one page. It That's was a testament to simplicity yeah, yeah like I think that's something I learned is that you don't have to go over the top and um, do just a million things and have all these character changes and <clears throat> try and be super clever you can just do you can just make a movie about a moment from your day and that can be just as good right yeah, yeah if the writing is great and the acting is great yeah you know it, it can be a simple shot I um, think um, this whole movie of moi was all the acting because there wasn't really much writing in it at all it was just um I mean, it was really only one page and only a couple. There was hardly any dialogue. The whole thing, I think, rides on the performances. So I'm so grateful for you and Bethany and Maya. You guys were awesome. They did a great job. Um, but 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 credit where credit's due to, right? Like if you had to compose those shots terribly and you didn't catch the moments hmm. and you didn't follow it and you didn't keep the rhythm right and the beats and the, the build to that crescendo would have fallen on its ass. It all had to peak at that moment. Mm. Yeah. It was – we carefully did plan out every shot to make it um, – I think also because we were working with such a limited budget and time, <laughs> we didn't have the time or the budget to cover it from all these different angles. So we did plan each shot specifically. I think it's a, it's a great you, exercise, that. Yeah, yeah, it's like shooting with film. You know, when you have limited roles, it's yep. so specific. Like we only covered each – um, each moment from the script from one angle. Okay. Which also made it difficult in the edit because there were particular times when we didn't actually have the option to speed it up if we wanted to because it was only taken from that one so specific... you were very confined by what you had. Definitely. Yep. Like the edit was planned out before we started shooting. Yeah, so there's pros and cons to that, hey? It's like it's simpler to edit in terms of what I have to pick from. Yeah. Yeah, but then if you don't love what you have... Yeah. And you're like, fuck. Yeah, there's one moment in the movie <laughs> that I always want to speed up. Um, there's one shot, but there's nothing we could have done because it was only shot from one specific angle. And unless you jump cut it, mm -hmm. then there's no other way. So there's always this one moment in the movie, which is when she um, turns her bike around and is riding in the other direction. Mm -hmm. I, want, I really want that shot to just speed up. And maybe it's the anxiety as well because you want her to get away from you. Uh, that's but interesting. I'm always like find my body even just like moving forward because I'm just like, I don't know if it's me wanting the character to get away or me as the director being like, oh my God, I wish we sped Hurry up this up. shot. Yeah. Yeah. Hurry up, get to the next bit. Well, that's really interesting too from, from an editing standpoint because I don't um, – I only really understand editing from a photography aspect. So like when I'm editing, especially not so, – editing stills is not the same to me anyways as, as editing an editorial and that the images that you pick and you have to sort of have that – internal response but i i tried to start editing lauren and let's m m move away from just the fucking nightmare of trying to learn how to use the, the software <laughs> but but understanding beats and and rhythm of editing and the yeah. emotional input and that's a really great way of seeing it from an editor's perspective i I feel like, and so then you have to run with that. Like um, something great that was said to me once was when I was um, learning how to shoot editorials and what have you, um, just when you've got your thousand photos at the end of the shoot, pick the ones that would stop you if you were flicking through a magazine. Yes, and yes. And there's your style. Yes, so that's same thing with, same thing with editing when you're watching back your footage. Anytime yep. you feel something, they're the shots you end up using. Yeah. Or when you feel like you need to see the other person's reaction, that's when you cut. Like it's all so oh, emotional. That's great. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the – so from the other side that um, good acting coaches will teach you to always be on mm. even when you're – you don't think that you're in the shot or what have you. So Absolutely. They might end up cutting back to you more often. Absolutely. If That's such a big thing. Mm. Always like actors who give a little more when they're listening, They those shots always get used. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Um, 
And so that went on to the official selection for MIF, which mm-hmm. is where I last saw you. Yes. Which was – That was my dream. That's I, epic. I mean, is it every <coughs> Melbourne filmmaker's dream to get into MIF? That's – just it's the hard, holy man. grail. It's real hard. <laughs> it's so hard. Yeah. I got rejected from MIF the year before with my um my VCA graduate film. Right. I so wanted to go to MIF with that movie and it just wasn't there. It wasn't at that point. And now I'm grateful that I didn't go to MIF with that VCA movie. You know, I'm really glad that it was the, with this movie because yeah, which is outside just, of VCA. Yeah, it's and it was my own and it yeah. felt just felt uh right. So um, that MIF was so fun. It was so great. We did the um, week of Accelerator and you got to go to lots of talks and you got to meet all these other filmmakers and they play it at Hoyts on that big screen and I've never seen a movie, um, one of my movies played on such a big screen before so that was super cool. It's a trip. Yeah, and the sound was so good and people really do come out as well at, at MIF. Like so many people come and see the new filmmakers movies which is really nice it's not an you know at going to lots of festivals you do go to festivals where it's an empty cinema no one turns up so normal but at MIF people turn up for the um newcomer movies so it was yeah. great to see a full cinema it was full yeah yeah and what was it there was five films on five shorts or something I think yeah five or six and then there's two um two different screenings so all together there are about 10 or 12 I can't remember now but and you picked yeah. up a, a- Director's Award at Byron Bay. I did at Festival? Byron Bay. Yeah, Best that was young female. Was it? Yeah, it was um, Australian Filmmaker of the Year Award. <laughs> it was so fun. That's fucking amazing. It was great. Yeah, you must have been like, tell me about that. It was great. Um, I got to go to Byron Bay for a week, which was really fun. Is Loved that for Byron? Are you? paid for or you jet up there yourself and go along to the how does that all work i can't remember now i f- don't i think i paid my own way to mm-hmm. go there there are some festivals you go to where they do pay for you to go like i went to a festival in um germany where they paid for my flights to go over wow. but for, I, for more uh no for that was for my sh- short film i made before that called wolf so that was a trip that was incredible um that's unreal but i think for byron we uh we paid our own way I think it was a couple of years ago now but mm. anyways and yeah so that was um so fun they gave you a, pa- a pass to go see all the films and then we had um the closing night and we just danced and it was so fun and they had a whole lot of really good projects too like there was a whole VR room which was incredible mm-hmm. got to see some cool VR projects and yeah, it was did great. you did you know that you were getting that award before you went up there? No, they oh, don't tell you. Yeah, they never tell you. Wow, what a trip, hey! So, yeah, it's always um, yeah surprise. So, uh, before I move on to my next with moi, because working on it with you seemed seamless, right? You had a great team. Everyone was super super positive and helpful, and had their shit together. Was what was the biggest you know, were there any major hurdles with getting that done? Because seemingly you'd made one the year before, so that's a reasonably quick turnaround. I think it was the not getting into MIF was what I was like, I've got to make something else. Oh. I always find not getting something you want pushes you so much further than getting what you want. Mm-hmm. So that's definitely why I made the movie so quickly. I was just desperate to do something else outside of film school. Um And it was surprisingly so easy. Honestly, my VCA third year film was so hard. It was really hard to make. Um, And I was worried that that's just what filmmaking was. But then making moi was so great because it it just came together so easily. And there were almost no hurdles. The biggest hurdle was getting the funding. Mm -hmm. And by funding, I mean, you know, coming up with the money ourselves because it wasn't funded. Right. So we did um, sausage sizzles to raise money. Um, So that was, that was tough, honestly, Mm -hmm. spending a couple of Saturdays in an empty car park, just trying to (laughs) sell sausage. It was, we felt a little desperate and that feeling is the opposite to creativity. So yeah, yeah, that was hard. But then once the, that part of it was over, it was easy. I think I can't, I mean, there were tough times in the edit always. You always, um, when you first put it together, I feel most filmmakers feel a little bit disheartened at their first right. cut because um, it just as a first pass is always not as good as it can be. Mm-hmm. And so it's the first time you're watching the movie outside of your head and in the real 
on the screen. Mm -hmm. Um, But of course, after you spend more time finessing it and then you get the sound design in, Mm -hmm. um, then it becomes exactly, well, for if you're lucky, it becomes exactly what you hoped it would be. Those layers. Honestly, I was so lucky that there were no major hurdles because everyone was so easy to work with and everybody Mm. everybody gave up their two nights of their life, you know, to work on it and – it was great. Everybody pitched in so much. Like I remember Emma, our producer, Emma's dad made those wood fire pizzas for us in his wood fire pizza oven out the back of his house. Oh, wow. And people just went above and beyond in every department. So That's nice. And I think that's um, a testament to the con- content, you know, and, and mm. but not to say that it needs to be something um, – super poignant or super political or or what have you for people to get behind it. I mean, the, the horror community will get behind anything. Not, not anything that's rubbish, but they love it so much that people <clears throat> will give their time no 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 troubles. You know, they, they, it's, a, it's a big sell, uh, an easy sell. For some people, yeah, it's the genre and yeah. some people it's the message. They just want yes. it. And then for some people it's the people. Like there are a bunch of filmmakers in my life. I would do anything for them yeah. no matter what their film was. I love them and respect them so much that I would, you know, I'd make food for them on their set. I would mm-hmm. do, I would be a runner. Yeah, just to make sure that they get it done. Yeah. 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 I think that's um, ultimately sort of I have a couple of objectives with this podcast and one of them being that I start that this becomes a little bit of a, a funnel or a highway for all of us that are of the same mindset that, that, that we then now start helping each other out with whatever comes down the line. Um, e- even two people who have already been on the podcast, um, Johnny and, and Johnny Balaz and, and Lauren Bailey, we've discussed the, 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 the nightmare that I had trying to make my film and it's still sitting on a hard drive. Mm-hmm. Tied up. By oh, we've all got things on hard drives <coughs> that will probably never see the light of day, or maybe they'll come out in five years and be, That's you know, nuts. the and next it, best thing. Yeah, and they've gone and like uh, contacted people, and maybe I can put you in touch with this editor, and maybe I can put you in that touch with this editor, and um, I think that's a really a great little thing, and, and and someone who isn't from Melbourne, that's my ultimate goal is to try and have like a little tribe or group of filmmakers that whenever an idea comes up we float it mm-hmm. amongst the group and going what what have we got that can go and get this done now yeah, yeah. you know where we, we go and spend two days and just no one do can it. do it alone like you no need way. to have you can't. everyone needs to have a group of people around them who are willing to sacrifice something as at this level because yeah. later when you get funding you pay people and that's how it comes together but in the early stages you you can't do it without your group of people you yeah. know and it's it's a really i find it i probably struggle with this struggle's a strong word um it's just like you can struggle it's okay we all struggle <laughs> yeah you know, you know, like i just like i've got two scripts two other scripts that i've written just short little things um that i just wished i had a crew and we, that we could, I could just go, guys. Okay, when are we all free? Let's go and do it now, because um, it just benefits all of us if we're making things. You know, and it doesn't have to be over the top, like you said. It can be a single cam. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, you know, a lapel and a and a live sort of raw, um, what's the word? Wild mic. Yeah. And two actors and it can be great. Yeah. And you, you know? can do a lot of stuff in one night. Like you can 100%. you can shoot a film in one day. You can. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Especially in on the short variety. Um, if the if the writing is good and the acting is good and and, and get it done. The hard part is is you don't generally have musicians and sound designers in as a part of that tribe. Mm-hmm. That's my experience. So then you've got to go and find them and that's where it seems that every short film that Gets enough momentum to get made to to get made gets stopped in its tracks. Is that the post production is very tricky because those are um, oh, well unless you're lucky and you have a bunch of mates who are sound designers and work out you know they're the those facilities sometimes it's really hard to get those for free. I mean any anyone yep. can ask their friend to be a caterer or to hold a light, but 
to do a sound mix or a color grade. You it's do need those brutal. post facilities and yep. that's where you do need a bit of cash, I find, yep. yeah, to get yep. it across the line, 100%. especially sound because sound is so important in, in film. More than half of a film, I think, is sound. So you have to put so much work into that, I think. And it's the one that seems to let people down. Absolutely, because it's it's often underlooked. People think it's all about the camera, but it's not. Yeah, it's all about the sound. Yeah, it it really really is. And then, and then to give it that cinematic, sort of professional feel, the sound design that needs to happen there. I mean, even I remember doing a short film um, when I first moved to Melbourne, and it was shot really really well, <clears throat> and it was a great little story. But when I saw the final product. The, the the sound design was just and I had no real knowledge of filmmaking at that point at all. I just started training as an actor. But I remember saying to the director, I was like, it looks great, man, but there's this scene where I'm walking towards the camera and I'm walking away and there's no Doppler effect on yeah. the walking. It's just the constant walking as I'm walking away. It's so distracting you, when the sound is wrong. You dial that off, dude. You know, like Doppler effect, the sound builds, gets loud and then fades. Yeah, that's, yeah. <clears throat> I was like, that's that gave you away, you know, straight yeah. up. I'm like, ooh. God, the sound designers we had on this movie, Troy and Niels, they did the most incredible, spectacular job. Because I don't know if you remember, but the um, when we were filming this, I'm not sure if you were um, on this on the second day. I wasn't. When we had, did you ever see how we shot the tracking shots with um, the DOP inside the bike? No. We had no. this bicycle and it had a carriage at the front, and he would sit inside the carriage like a child would in, you know, those bikes mm. where parents ride their <laughs> kids to school. So he would sit in the carriage with the camera, and we would, um, a grip would, Jess, who was incredible, would ride the bike, and Charlie would sit in the front carriage and shoot out of it. And that was how we got all the tracking shots of Bethany on the road. And the problem, <laughs> we had this major problem with the bike. It um, it had this squeaky sound. Oh, I don't know what was man. wrong with the, um, I think it was the brakes or, mm-hmm. <laughs> or something, but it just made the sound that went like, like that and it ruined all of the sound for the whole Did movie. Did you know that it was happening at the time? It started off really softly right. and then it got gradually worse and um, I think at one point somebody thought that they could fix it by putting um, oil in the brakes, mm-hmm. which was such a bad idea really? because then it made the brakes stop working oh. and it, um, it made the, the sound even worse. So actually now that I'm thinking about it, this was a hurdle, a big hurdle. That's a big Back hurdle. Back to the hurdles. Yeah. This was a hurdle. So we couldn't, I feel, I feel terrible. We couldn't use any of the sound um, from the actual shoot that we recorded. So my two sound designers, they recreated everything in post, like the sound of her breathing, which we got a wild um, recording of on one of the days. So if you watch the movie closely, actually, I don't even know if you can tell, but all of her breathing is redone and every sound from like the jingle of things on her bag and the pedal and her riding the bike, everything was recreated in post. Yeah. And you, I mean, and you guys had a um, pretty quick turnaround on that too, right? Yeah, well, Six we wanted you? to submit it to MIF, and so we shot in late November, edited in December, and then finished it in January to submit. Yeah, yeah, yeah so it was very quick. That's great. I think a quick project's a good project. You don't want to be, <sighs> and the script was written very, <clears throat> very quickly as well. I think we, it was just one or two drafts, and because it was just such a simple concept, we just, um, and we cast Bethany. Very quickly. It all came together very, very quickly, which is good. You don't want something to no. drag on and on for, you know, you don't want to. It's it, fucked. People are putting themselves out enough. You don't want to drag people through misery, you know, yeah. for months trying to get something up. And it's, and it, I had a, a guest on here, Mark Diaco, um, last year, and, and we were talking about a feature that I've written, which is, I won't go on the tail because anyone who is a regular listener will have heard this a million times. <laughs> But um, anyways, I, I was telling him about the script and all these sort of serendipitous things that had come sort of uh, that had lined up and he said, that's in my experience, he's very experienced. Um, that's when you know it's going to go. You know, if it's if nothing, if there's no luck around it and, and no one comes out of the universe that goes, I can help you with this or I know about this or I know whatever, yeah. fucking... Walk away. Put your energy to something that, that slides. 
One of my favorite filmmakers, Jill Soloway, said that making a film is like pushing a boulder up a hill and it's bloody hard. Like mm. you are pushing this thing up a hill and it's always going to be hard. But when it's the right project, you'll notice other people appear beside you and oh, put their hands on it great. as well. And then it feels like you're a whole team pushing the boulder yeah. up the hill and you get up there. And if you ever feel like you're the only person pushing the boulder, mm -hmm. it means it's the wrong project. <laughs> Which I always think about. I will remember that. Yeah. My Lauren took me four years and everyone kept pulling out, pulling out, pulling out. And the only reason it got made in the end was there was just enough momentum that it couldn't stop. Yeah, that's you know? good. That's what you need, the momentum. Yeah. But it, but it, but in hindsight, I, I mean, if it gets made all the way, then maybe my hindsight will change. But right now it's drifting so far back that, Maybe it's not of any use to me anymore. So you've already shot it? Oh, it's all, yeah, it all got shot. But you haven't finished it. It hasn't even... So what even do you need to finish it? I need an editor. Yeah. And I need sound. And I've got a composer. Can you edit it yourself? No, that's what I mean. I tried. You can do it. You mm. can teach yourself to edit. Yeah, no. So, so I'll tell you what <laughs> happened. I'll tell you what happened. And it's what we, you and I were talking about before about a list of priorities and time allocation. I don't know why I just told you to edit your own film when your baby is literally due today. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's what happened is I was teaching myself and I managed to compile it with all of the takes that I wanted in chronological order of the script mm -hmm. and attach all of the sound and start to learn a bit about color grading. And then I started to venture into the editing tools and blah, 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 blah and finding the beats and how did I want to showcase the scenes? Was it? Was it like it was in the script or did I want to maybe, you know, do a sort of Pulp Fiction thing where it was back to front? Um, and then it was like, I'm also writing a feature. I'm also working full time. I'm also trying to be a good husband and, you know, all these things plus find time to exercise, which is super important and, and, and keep filling my brain with well-being and health and understanding so you think in it's the world. like you have a list of four things and it's like pick one and it's like exactly. be a good filmmaker, have a social life, be a good husband and father yeah, and, you yeah. know. And, and and work on something creative, whatever. Yeah. Plus go out to auditions and hustle. and Yeah, you, you can't do everything. So, no one can. No. So I, sat, I probably sat there for two months and then Erica fell pregnant and I went, no, no. Um, and it was a whole thing, basically very, very succinct. I'm actually going to, I'm trying to put together a podcast where I bring in a director, producer and run this situation by them mm -hmm. just so that I'm 100% certain that I did the right thing and that I was within my rights to do what I did. But the director and the DOP after the film was made came back to me and said, we want to renegotiate our contract and we want full creative control of the post of your film that you wrote, paid for and acted in. And then we will come to you to run it by you as so we So you're edit. the writer and producer of the project? Yeah. And you had another producer come by and also a director? No, no, just another director. I produced it. Oh, so you're the producer? Yeah. Oh, I well, am. it's your film. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, not to mention I created it. Um, and I've been running it for four years. Yeah, mate, it's all you. It's all me. Yeah, <laughs> and and so and we want copyright for a director's cut, and we want control of the posts and the sound and the editing, and um, we're really upset that you stepped in on shoot and told us what to do. I kind of feel that that's the right of the producer You're paying for it. It sounds like, yeah, maybe too many too many cooks in the kitchen yeah, so and not everyone was on the same page about what it was. Which is amazing to me that they weren't. Um, but anyways, I said, well, you can stick that and you guys, are, you're out. But then when this happened, when, when Erica fell pregnant, I said, all right. I came back to him and said, you can. Anyways, I've talked about this a million times. But you know, I said, you can have it. You can have the, but you've got to pay for it. Yeah. And you've got to have it done by December. And so did they? They said yes and now they haven't. Oh. They haven't even got a, they haven't even got a first pass. From an outsider's perspective, <laughs> it sounds like this project has um, it sounds like you should if it, if I could give you any advice, it I'd would be to it. start um, a new project yeah. because this one seems like it has um, some toxic 
kind of totally. relationships and you don't want to be putting, especially now that your time is so precious with you about to become a father, I would say just start something new that yeah. is your own and make sure that the people you, you choose to work on it are um, people who will, yeah, be respectful and, you know, that you're all on the same page <coughs> because – to keep going back and to keep pushing on that project, it's taking a lot of energy from you and it, it doesn't sound healthy. No, it's, it's, yeah. it isn't. Um, and I put in about six months in after we shot it of all of that injection and I really, I mean, I have spoken to them twice since I handed it over to them um, and just spoke to them the other day and I said, oh, okay, you've got to the end of March. But I have a, a good friend of mine, Nicholas Clifford, actually, I got cast in a TV in a car commercial last year at Haval, which was done in the same room that I auditioned for you. Oh, really? Yeah. At up, um, um, Truce. Truce. Yeah. Well, okay, so Nick, who runs Tr- Truce. Oh, I see. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> um, is speaking to one of his friends about about um, b- being that he's a writer, director, producer. Mm-hmm. He shares your opinion that he might have a, 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 a favour. That mm-hmm. might be able to get a first pass on it. But, yeah, so – and that was the other thing is I was full throttle into writing a feature, mm-hmm. um, which I'm sort of almost at the very end of into the sort of 15th draft. Congratulations. It, Just finishing a draft I think it, is huge. It's so huge, isn't it? And, yeah. And, and so much like what you said about your first film, like you get to your first draft and you're like, mic drop. Yeah. This is <laughs> – so good yeah. yeah oh my god and yeah. then a pro has a look at it and they're like well you could probably shave 50 pages off it um yeah. get out all of that exposition and you all of your characters need beefing up and their journeys <laughs> yeah, need it's to brutal. be <laughs> it's brutal getting feedback yeah but it's great i mean i've i have learned an incredible amount about storytelling which only helps you as an actor yeah absolutely um so what's next? For me? Mm. Um, well, I've been – since making that short film, I've been working a little bit in television, which has been incredible. Right? How? I um, got a job at this incredible production company called Grist Mill run by Robin Butler and Wayne Hope mm-hmm. and I got a job as their assistant right. and I'm still working there um, to this day mm-hmm. and uh, they make funny TV shows They've and also working on um, yeah ad- adult shows and kids shows as well. And so when I first started working for them, they were making back and very small business for the ABC. So I worked as their assistant and um, I got to see everything behind the scenes from production meetings and seeing how um, Robin directed it. And I got to be on set the whole time, which was incredible. And then they were also simultaneously writing a children's comedy show called The Investigators. And when we got around to making that a year later, they asked me to be one of the directors on it. And so they oh, they were sort shit. of mentoring me as a director while also having me as an assistant. So that was incredible. I got to direct four episodes of that. And now I'm obsessed with television. I mean, I already was, but yeah. now I'm just like, <laughs> oh, my God, I just want to direct TV. So you want to write something, do you think? or I think I want to mainly direct, actually. Okay, cool. I think I'll always write because it's – the way I get out ideas yeah. and I, I love writing and doing short form things. Like I think I want to make another short film and mm-hmm. maybe I'll, I'll probably end up writing it just so I can get it done because mm-hmm. like, you know, relying on other people sometimes slows things down. Totally, and if you totally. just want to get something done, just it's do it. sometimes better just to, you know, push it forward yourself. 100%. So I think I'll always be writing little things. Mm-hmm. Um, but end game, I really want to do TV. Right. Yeah. Right. And what do you think like genre wise? Uh, I love comedy and I love drama. So, oh, okay. and I love children's TV. I oh, do. So you? Okay, great. Anything in in those three. Well, that's a good spectrum. Yeah. So, you're you've you've directed these four episodes. Mm-hmm. What was the show? It's called The Investigators. The Investigators. It's about um, these four kids in primary school who start a detective agency in one of the kids' backyard, um, <laughs> Granny Flat, and they, uh, in every episode they solve a mystery at their school or um, in the neighbourhood. It's wow. a comedy kids' show. Yeah, great. Yeah. And is that show still running? Yes. It's, right. um It runs on um, the ABC here in Australia and it's on Netflix around the world. So how do you make that jump then to, you know, be – you're with this company now. You've done the four episodes. Mm -hmm. You're still with them so it went well. Yeah. Um, How do you, you know, okay, guys, 
like how do, I want to direct a full show like you give tell me, me. A go. I don't know okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know when I figure okay, it out wow well, okay I guess you've just got to hit them up don't you I think it's about hustling yeah. I think you've just got to keep <clears throat> Um, putting yourself out there and never getting complacent or um, thinking that things will come to you. Mm. And I think I've talked to a lot of people who are older in the industry and say the same thing, like nobody can be complacent. Everybody has to, no matter what level you're at, you have to always be on your game and um, always, I think it's also about making your own work. Mm -hmm. Like you said earlier, it's not about just waiting for the phone to ring. I think you have to just always be wanting to make something and have that drive. You have to, you absolutely have to. I think, um, because even, even if nothing comes of it, you're internally, you're still growing as a creative. Definitely. You know, like if you're writing little short films that never get made but you're it's collective hours it's collective time oh, no project you know? is ever a waste of time even if it, exactly. if it never fin- gets finished yeah. it's always worth something yeah so i guess i mean if it were me and i'm just spitballing um and i'm in there uh, and i'm obviously respected by these guys and 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 hustling is what you need to do then you need to or hopefully you find someone who's got a great little project and you go and you bring that bring it to them and then it, it it ticks the money boxes and you go, but I'm directing this. Yeah. Yeah, that's the move. Definitely. I, I mean, I imagine even if they say no, they're gonna respect you for coming in with the, the grit um to, to pitch something, right? Like I think you've got to be clear about what you want in the project too. Like I feel like I'm always gonna be going to people saying I want to direct your show because mm-hmm. I really want to be a director but if you're wanting to be a writer that's different and if you want to be producer like I'm happy not to be um I, I really like producing but my main thing I love directing more than anything and so I feel like I'd be happy to work for any producer and to help them with their vision to get their vision yeah on the you know on the screen mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be my own creation I'm just I'm totally. just happy to direct so. yeah 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 um but in terms of like just opening that door as opposed to i don't know i'm just like i think it's such a you're you're in such a unique spot like how do you or is it something that you have to it's not because because i've never thought about being a director i think I what don't do know. you want to do well i just want to act like if if, yep. if, I, if i found out that i or not if i found out if i if it turns out that i end up acting in my own content in terms of what I write, great. Yeah. But I would prefer – I like the the breakdown. You're the actor, go do the acting thing. Like I heard someone saying the other day that that they didn't, didn't, didn't feel as empowered – this is an A-lister – empowered as an actor that they needed to become a producer as well in order for them to not be sitting around being told what to do anymore. And I'm like, man, I am all good to be told what to do. Mm-hmm. You know, like if I get to act full time, I'll do whatever you want. Does anybody act full time? Yeah, Does no, that exist? Yeah. I mean, you know or what I mean. direct full time. I would love that. Yeah. It'd be great. <laughs> it would be great. But I don't need like to have some kind of power trip or to be empowered by Oh, I'm producing this. Yeah, as I think well. we're similar in that way. We yeah. just want to do what we love to do, and totally. we don't care about yeah the hierarchy. That's of right. It. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, I feel like well, I don't know if it's unfortunately. I mean, we were talking about this before about um, how nice it would be to just to be able to go to your di- auditions, keep your training up, and know that those numbers were going to pay off. Whereas yeah. now it's like. No, I, I have to learn how to write stuff. If I want to act and, and have proof of acting, I have to create my own. So I'm having to do all these things. And, and ultimately, by the time you get to the place you want to be, you've been a producer on multiple projects and you've written multiple projects and maybe directed. But so one of the, the, the sort of, I don't want to say traps, but one of the not so great, uh, byproducts of that mentality when I was shooting Lauren everyone said why don't you direct it because me and the director weren't getting along yeah and even he said maybe you should direct this uh, to his credit like but I said no fucking way man I'm still getting my head around acting I don't know if I could direct and act because they are so um yeah. you have to I don't know how people do it you yeah. have to um 
yeah, I, I honestly don't know how, how people have that kind of self-awareness to be able to direct themselves or direct their own performance. You have to be very skilled to be able to direct and act in a yeah. project. Yeah. I think like I, I've directed editorials, photographic editorials that I've been in and it's only because I knew the camera side of things so well. So I had everything else already planned and it was, you know, seven years of doing that or eight years of doing that. But for me, having only been an actor for like two and a half years at that point, <clears throat> to direct, having never directed and coming up with a shot list and mm. and doing 18-hour days, nah. Yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot and it would take away from the performance. and that. So that was the trade-off. So unfortunately I got lumped with a shitty director in order to get it done <laughs> look it's a trade-off it's a trade-off it's straight up now i'm just gonna not be rude but i'm gonna do a quick time check because i know sure. that we both have to go what's the That's time it. it's five to five to ten okay cool that's perfect great i really appreciate you coming down man it's Thanks so good for to having see you me. again it's been awesome it's so good to see you again and just to it's um rare to get to talk about stuff so right yeah yep that's one of the great things about these is, is it's like if we were sitting down just hanging out at a cafe we might have got half of the content yeah that we did in, in a forced long form unscripted conversation yeah it's awesome thank you thanks buddy